out there questions. What's what's the most dangerous animal in the Amazon, would you say? Mammal. Let's go with mammal. Dangerous mammal. Like dangerous in terms of you walking around doing the solo hike. I'm gonna disappoint everybody with this, but it's 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 humans. It's nothing. There's no if I'm out in the Amazon, there's nothing that's going to attack me. You know, and in in India you might have you might have a, an old leopard or a tiger that's missing a tooth that yeah. decides your prey. Or you might have an angry elephant that's in must that just decides to just decides to flatten you. In the Amazon, you're not there's real jaguars won't even let you see them. Yeah. And there's really nothing else. One of my friends a brilliant scientist friend of mine, Pat, got attacked by a rabid ocelot once, but that's like a dieseled house cat just having a fit. You know, that's yeah. wasn't the worst thing in the world. <laughs> just the assholes of yeah. the whole kingdom. Okay, what uh in terms of humans, you've said uh, um that the tribes, some of them uncontacted, yeah, uh, can be exceptionally dangerous. What's your experience with them? What should people learn? Because it, it's such a fascinating part of life here on earth that there's tribes that don't have much or any contact with the quote unquote civilized world. I, I th most of the people that I meet don't actually really understand how, how isolated these people are or how weird it is that we're sitting here and that we have iPhones and airplanes and all this stuff. And these people are living naked in the forest at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the thing though, you know, and I also was recently somebody, somebody said, oh, there's like paleolithic tribes. And it's like, no, 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 just by default, they're modern tribes mm -hmm. living now. They just happen to be living out in the jungle. And there's a huge debate about, you know, do we try and contact them and bring them in? And there's two camps of people on this who they say that it was, it was, it was the trauma of the rubber boom that sent them out that far into the forest and made them terrified of the outside world. And so that's also what made them so hyper violent. I mean, there, there, I, there's one of the guys we work with on our team, Victor was in, I think it was 2004, he was coming down river and he had a load of mahogany wood and he's piloting this boat and he sent two people, husband and wife ahead to go start cooking breakfast on the beach so they could put the little kitchenette thing down and pick, put the propane. He sent them ahead as the, he's going nice and slow with the barge coming down the river. They go ahead, reach the beach, they get out. He starts cutting some cane to start put, making a fire. Tribe comes out, no warning. They just start screaming. They start shooting arrows. The man instantly gets an arrow through the leg and it pins his leg so he can't run. He tells his wife, go, save yourself. And she does. She jumps in the water. There's arrows falling around her too. And as she's floating down the river, she looks back and the last thing she sees is these guys getting to her husband and beginning to rip him apart. As Victor comes down the river, this is a guy we work with every day, he comes down the river and sees his friend disemboweled, opened up, dissected, his parts are all over the beach, the beach is red, and they only found out what happened because they found her later on holding onto a stick in the river and they're like, what happened? And she was like, they just attacked. They don't want people on their land. On the, on the, on the, the sort of the underground WhatsApp chain of the Amazon, they, a few in August, like this was not in internationally known. Um, some loggers went up and tried to steal a few trees from where the tribes were. And then everybody sent the pictures of what the loggers looked like after a few days, because mm -hmm. the tribes porcupined them with arrows. They were laying there on the ground with just arrows sticking out of their bodies. And then the, eventually the authorities came out and looked and there was just these white bodies. I'll show you the pictures later. There's just these white puffy bodies with like the skulls sticking out. And it was like, you don't mess with these tribes. I wonder what are the, what's the mythology around that they construct around who these outsiders are? Are they gods? Are they demons? Are they humans? What, who are they? Who are we to them? Well, you, you gotta go back to the rubber boom. The, the, the rubber barons went down there and at the start of the industrial revolution, the only way to get rubber was to mine it from the trees that were out in the forest. And so the only way to do that, because you can't make a rubber plantation in the jungle, the the rubber, when it's in plantation form, when it's a monoculture, it gets this leaf blight and it all dies. Henry Ford tried it, it didn't work. And so what they did was they sent these people down who just whipped, burned, enslaved, raped, and pillaged the people. It's one of the worst periods in human suffering that I've ever read about. 
Um, one missionary said they were killing the locals the way you or I would kill a mosquito. They just went nuts. And so they sent them out and they would come back with rubber. And this would go to fuel the industrial revolution for hoses and gaskets and tires and all this stuff that suddenly we needed. Um, and it was during that time that these, 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 you know, gangs of foreigners would go into the jungle to enslave the natives that these uncontacted tribes went back into the jungle and said, not us. And they have six foot bows and seven foot arrows with bamboo tips. They, they make the bamboo tips into razor blades. And so when those things fly, actually one of my rangers, one of the jungle keepers team um, was present when the tribes had come out onto the river and he tried to help them because they're nomadic and they live out there. And so there's an element of like brother, like, you know, yeah. they're trying to be like, you don't need to be like this. Like we're friendly. So they sent a canoe across the river with bananas. And so he's up to his waist in the river and the tribes are right across the river and, and they shot and he sees the arrow coming right at his head. And as he moved to the side, it hit him at the temple and sliced him back towards the ear, opening him to the skull. He's fine. But let me tell you something, when he goes and gets a crew cut, it's the most badass skull, you, the scar you've ever seen, man. And so he he always keeps it real short on that side. But but even if lesson? you try to help them, they're, they're not necessarily friendly. That's a, tough, that's a tough lesson. Yeah. I suppose they have a point. They have a point and, and protecting them is is a default of you know now that we're protecting all this ecosystems and all these other indigenous communities it's like we all sort of live with this knowledge that they're the hermanos the brothers are out there and that's the way they want to keep it and so we just have to be respectful of like you don't camp on certain beaches at certain times of the year because we know that they might be there you really have to be careful about that have you yourself interacted with any my interaction with them came on a solo where i pushed it a little bit too far and I, I was planning to do a three week, this was like the big one. And I, I got dropped off by poachers up a river and I, I went past the point where there were like names there. I said, what, what, what tributary are we on? And they were like, tributary. And I was like, okay. And I said, leave me here. And I remember the guy being like, are you committing suicide? And he, he didn't understand that. I was like, no, I have a backpack and I have like food and like, I'm gonna like take videos and I have a tripod. And I was like, we're cool here. And, they looked at me like they were like, goodbye. And I was like, all right. And I like went up this river and, and again, like you just, you learn these things like, you know, it, it was only when I'd been alone for a week that you realize you're, you know, that saying they're like, oh, you're, you're born alone and you die alone. It's like, no, you're not. You're born into a room full of people usually. At the very least, your mother's there <laughs> for everybody. And, uh, and so you've been around people probably, if you're a normal person, yeah. every single day of your life. Yeah. You've seen dozens, if not hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you realize what a social creature we are. Because on day six, it gets weird. For me, it got weird. I know there's people that can do it longer. So what, is that, what does that mean? Like longing for contact? Like, longing, are you lonely? Longing for contact, the distortion of reality in the sense that like, you know, you wake up and there's no one there and you start to, you know, you're going up a river. So I would, I would keep, I kept, I kept looking back down river and almost thinking of my life as something, it was almost like I had already died and I had yeah. gone to somewhere else. And I was looking back on that life as like something that I had experienced. And then there, there came this panic of what if it's gone? Or like, what if oh, World yeah. War III broke out and I just don't know about it? My family in New York is vaporized. And something just, you just, you're, you're, you're. you're <laughs> so actually your ability to comprehend and interpret reality kind of requires other people. It's not just that you're lonely. You need that contact to actually just perceive the world, make sense of it, all of that. So you start basically hallucinating I, in a certain kind of way. I started feeling very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, it doesn't help also that like Santiago told me these stories where he's like, if you hear capuchins sounding not quite monkeys, mm -hmm. if you hear capuchin monkeys sounding not quite like capuchins, he goes, it's the tribe and they're coming to get you. And then, so, um, the guy who was shot, Ignacio, they showed me videos where we saw them on the beach and they're communicating in monkey calls. They're using it as code so that we don't understand them, even though we don't speak their language. But they're they're using animal calls. And so every night you go to sleep and then you go, did that Tinamu sound off? And you're like, <laughs> shit. 
you know, and it's really hard to fall asleep. And then like one night I, I messed up and I, I left a fish. I like cleaned this fish. I ate like this huge fish. I just ate it to my face. You're, you're putting out like marathon levels of, of energy every day. Like, you know, Goggins would love solos. He'd be like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. You eat the fish raw? Uh, this one, I actually cooked it, but you know, the skeleton was laying there right, right outside my tent. Stupid. Yeah. And in the, the middle of the night, I wake up and I, I just could tell there was something there. You know, and then like you almost don't want to look. It's like when you're a kid at the basement door and you're like, is there a ghost? It's like, yeah. I like unzip the tent and I like open it up and there's like 27 black caiman outside of my tent all looking at me like this. And like some of their heads are this big and they're like, there's fish there. Can yeah. we have it? And I'm like, holy shit. And like, you know, I was like, do I, I kind of like had to like scooch the tent back and like move back and let them have their fish. And there was a host of crocodiles outside of my tent. Yeah. Um, but no, so then there was- oh, there, Wait, how many? Like 27, maybe. There's a lot. Big ones, small ones, medium-sized ones, every type. They were all there, and their eyes glow in the night. You know, you shine a light at animals, and they have a tapetum lucidum, and so their their eye shine comes back at you. If you shine a headlamp at a at a jaguar or a frog, or almost every, every animal has a, t a tapetum. So these are crocs. There's a whole lot of them. Yeah. I thought, can we go back to the part of the conversation <laughs> where you said the jungle is not dangerous? The humans are the most dangerous Well, did thing? they eat me? No. Why didn't they eat you? They wanted the fish. Is there some way of you interacting with them that shows that you're not a source of harm? I don't believe so. I'm sure there's someone out there that thinks they can talk to crocs, but. Because there's a there's a story of you grabbing a croc by the tail. Yes. What did you learn from that? Learn to not always listen to JJ. So JJ was testing you to. Uh, yeah, to see how stupid I was. How do you hold the crocodile exactly? You have to get him by the head, like an anaconda like this. And so. So you're one of the world experts at grabbing creatures by the head. I wouldn't say world expert, but I've done a lot of it. Um, I also have, you see how there's like kind of a ball there? Mm -hmm. That's where a crocodile tooth went in that side and like came out that side of my, oh. that was a really good chomp. And the watch I was wearing at the time saved me because that, like that. Um, just real fast, just chomp. Just whack. Like somebody took a sledgehammer, you put your hand on the table yep. and I just went, bah. Mm -hmm. Really hurt. Um, shouldn't have been doing that. What, what, how, did that, how did that come up? Because I caught a croc that was too big. So usually when we catch little caiman in the streams and we measure them to monitor the populations, um, you get it by the neck. And then I tuck the tail under my arm yeah. and I hold it. And you're talking about a little, you know, four foot croc, nothing. And I, I, this one, I dove into a, into a swamp and I caught like a six mm -hmm. foot spectacle caiman. And her head was big and I had her by the neck and I realized I couldn't get her tail under my arm because her tail was all the way back there. And she started thrashing. And it was like probably croc number 375 that I'd caught. And I just got a little cocky and I said, oh, she's, you know, I just, I just like grabbed her by a leg. I was like, I got this. And she just came back and tagged me and I went, okay, going to go back to being safe. Just to linger on it. What, uh, is it one of the one of the bigger predators in the Amazon? What and it's is it going to uh, are, are they going extinct? Black caimans. Black caiman were, cr I believe, they were critically endangered for a while because for a while the fashion industry loved their skin. It's soft mm -hmm. and it's black. Um, they're bouncing back a little bit now. You know, like most animals, if you leave them alone, they'll be fine. I mean, crocs have been through you know how many millions and millions of years on Earth before us. I mean, that's even the joke with, with the joke, but that's the grim reality of tiger conservation. It's, there was 100,000 tigers in 1900. Now there's 4,000 tigers left on earth. It's not rocket science. All you have to do is not bulldoze their forest and allow there to be some deer and tigers will be fine. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's so simple. And that's like sometimes where I feel like I have the dumbest job in the world. I'm like, guys, please stop killing the things that keep us alive. The Amazon regulates our global climate, produces medicine, is home to indigenous people. It's beautiful. Rainforests only cover 3% of the planet's landmass. Like it's not that much to ask. If you uh, leave their home untouched, they'll figure out how to have sex and multiply, except for pandas apparently, because uh, pandas you have to convince. Yeah. Um, humpbacks, humpbacks, they went down to, they went from 130,000 down to, I think about 8,000 at whaling times. And then when we banned whaling since that time, where I think we're back up to over 100,000 humpback whales, oh. they've bounced back. It's a success story. We're not going to lose them. Okay. So you're in a, on a solo hmm. 
with uh, yeah. Crocs looking at you. <laughs> See, this is why you're good at this. You know, I, I would have lost. We would have been we no. That's pretty epic. Forever. With the fish, that was your mistake. Okay. That was my I mistake. Mean, I, I, most people, I don't understand how you're still alive. I mean, I. It's, <laughs> it's really inspiring. When you come, we're gonna. I'm gonna show you. <laughs> you told me you're coming already. Yeah, you're hundred percent coming. Yeah, but you know, you <laughs> if there's any place, I mean, um, sort of a gr grim joke. But if there's any way to die, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. If I'm being honest, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool one. It's yeah. a pretty cool one. Go become part of the part. Of, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's. It's, I'm not even like joking. There's a there's a oneness to the whole thing. Every, all the stories, just reading your work. Looking at your work, I. It seems like you are part of this machine that is nature. The this this incredible machine. Like we all die, and we're all part of this big thing. That humans do have the capability to also construct narratives and stories and myths and tell them to each other and share them with each other and have more sophisticated ways, therefore, to communicate love to each other. But animals do as well. They communicate love, maybe more simply, maybe more honestly. <laughs> anyway, so you you with the Crocs and the fish. Yeah, so I, I messed up. I left the fish out. Crocs showed up outside my tent. But in the end, it was fine. I, I, I backed off. They had their way with the fish, and then they all started biting each other. It was fun to watch. Is and, that a general, sorry to interrupt, is that a general rule you want to not leave? Yeah, just like if you're camping in the Northeast, you don't leave like, you do a bear bag or a bear canister. You don't you don't want to invite the wild animals. I really did mess up. I kind of was just like, you know, whatever. I do this every now and then. I get a little too cavalier. Um, and the, the, the ocean has almost almost taken me down for that a few times. Um, but yeah, so the Crocs, and then you keep going for a few days. And my plan was to get to a point where I reached the end of the tributary. And this had a very... Um, you know, again, for me, this is like a pilgrimage. This is like, this is like me going into the heart of the, the very center and soul and essence of everything that I am fascinated with, like as close to God as you can get, because you're leaving every type of security, every human relationship. You're also pushing all your chips in. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I, you know, the, every step I took further up river, it got weirder and weirder and more intense. And every day and every moment it changed. And I would, I, I brought pictures at, at the time. There's no way to keep a phone charged. I didn't have like a power bank or anything. Um, you know, I brought pictures from home. I brought a, <laughs> I brought a National Geographic magazine, um, something just to, you know. And um, there came a day right when I was getting to the end, like to the point where the river was so shallow that. It was just a trickle and I was walking on the rocks and the Andes mountains were in front of me and I was like reaching the the place and the music was swelling. And then all of a sudden I saw smoke around the next bend. And I, I, I like my spine is reacting right now as I talk about it because I, I knew, I knew what I was going to see because I knew that it was impossible for loggers to be out there. There's no motor that could take you. The boat would have run aground. Mm -hmm miles ago and so I, I i went and this is the other this is the other idiot thing it's like just turn around yeah just do it i'm that kid though when you see like a wet paint sign like i walk by and i touch yeah. the wall yep and uh so i i i went around the bend and and i see i see a few naked people on the beach and they see me and we're like a good distance apart it's they're on the other side of the river but you know, arrow in hand, bow in hand, the, the the intention of pose. They're looking at me. They're clearly conversing. And that moment lasted for a, a, a long moment where I said, this is the part of the story where they are going to rip me apart, dissect me to see what I eat. I mean, every other story in the region that we've heard, that's the ending of it. If you're alone with these people, it's not gonna go well. And I have nothing to defend myself with. Um, and I just, I turned and I ran for like three hours and I got in the river and I swam for a while and I, all my food got wet. Um, I mean, everything, I just, you know, all just ran for go, dear life. just ran for dear life. And and my, my get out plan, the thing after I crossed the mountains and came down into the next tributary was I had a pack raft. Mm -hmm. It's a tiny little inflatable raft good enough to handle rapids. 
and I inflated the pack raft. Once the once the river was like six inches deep, I inflated the pack raft and I went and I went for the rest of that day into the night. I went into the point that my headlamp died and I was just floating floating in a raft down the Amazon and hitting into things. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna pa- I'm gonna pop this raft. So I got out of the raft, set up my tent, and I was like, I need some sleep. I was freaking out. I hadn't had food in now, you know, hours and hours and hours. As soon as I fell asleep, my asshole brain comes up with the dream of that I hear voices. They're right outside the tent. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, sleeping was worse than being awake. So I woke up, got back in the tent. And then at one point it was really cool because one of those, one of the same black came that had come for the the fish mm-hmm. as I'm going down river, he came right up next to me and the two of us were going. And he was just like motoring down river, this giant, like 16 foot crocodile. He just like came up to me and like looked at me as I was going. And it was funny because I wasn't scared of him. I was scared of them. And yeah, it took me like a week to get back to town. And and again, the things you learn in these moments, the the you know, the appreciation for your parents, the 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 what a hug feels like, you know, when you when you are are faced with pretty much certainty that you're not gonna get those things again, whether it's from MRSA or uncontacted tribes or, you know. Um I find that that it brings it brings it brings you this new joy for life where you just being that close to death. Yeah, you go you I you go my god this is all a miracle. It's sad because they're human just like you. Actually, how different are they? Like if you were forced to interact for a week together where they can't they're not allowed to kill you. <laughs> like not allowed to kill me. What would they are they how fundamentally different are they? Do you think? I don't think I don't think they're different. I think they're like any other Amazonian natives. Um they're 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 tall. They seem to have tall genetics. Um and there's places, you know, again, there's there's what is known and then there's what we know down there. Like there's there's one community where I don't know whether it was like a bad rainstorm or something, but some kid from the uncontacted tribes did end up in a village. And so we he learned Spanish or he learned whatever dialect they speak in that village. And so he's told us a little bit about what life was like with them, but like, they're just people. They're just people. They have their own culture. They know about medicines that we don't know about. They definitely have hunting practices that, that we don't understand. They can hit a spider monkey out of a 160 foot tree with a bamboo arrow. We can't do that. I mean, they are incredible hunters and also like living naked in the jungle with the bot flies and the mosquitoes. I don't know how they do it. Like sometimes at night, and again, we don't have night vision, whereas almost every other animal does. And sometimes we'll be sitting, you know, on our, you know, at the research station at night and we'll be just drinking and like looking out and at the, you know, we'll we'll scare each other. We'll go, you know, you realize if they were out there right now, they could be looking at us. And it's like, Mm -hmm. the truth is, is that when it's dark out there, they can't see. It's not easy to start a fire with matches and a lighter and gasoline. They do it with friction. They have some some beads on survival that we could really learn from. Um, not to mention that then you have people that believe that they are actually the guardians of the extinct giant ground sloth and what they're doing is you know living out there because they're protecting a secret population of previously extinct megafauna but there's all kinds i mean this it's like you you go into the crypto world so quick i've heard so many people be like (laughs) but then again you have to be humble at, at how little we know about about that world about the world of life like you said there's so much of life in the amazon that we don't uh creature would know names 